It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you'll always be. You are Jesus. You are holy, holy, holy. As we consider the truth of that, then, Father, we must consider what does our surrender to you look like in your awesome work for us, in the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. So, God, as we look at your word today, encourage our hearts, challenge us, and make us more like our Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray in his name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You can take your seats. And uh, while you're doing that, get your Bibles out and open them up to Mark chapter 8 as we continue in our Vertically Challenged series. The message today is on the topic of surrender. Not a very popular topic in our world today because our world doesn't think about surrender in any way in a good sense. Um, You think about waving the white flag, it's because you gave up, you lost, you quit. Um, See, we live in a world that's all about being self-made. You're out there trying to make your millions of dollars, get your three-car garage, uh, all your ducks in a row, and I want to be in control of my destiny And yet the word of God calls us to sacrifice and to surrender. And that's what we want to take a look at today and uh, consider these things. um, Because the reality in the economy of God, self-made man is not part of that economy. Um, In the economy of God, surrender is exactly the life that every single believer is called to. I want to see how Jesus taught about that and what we can learn from it. And then what do we need to do as a result of it today? So you've got your Bibles open by now, I trust. Let's stand together so we can honor God as we read his word. And I'm going to start at verse 27. And Jesus went on with his disciples to the village of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they told him, John the Baptist. And others say, Elijah. And others, one of the prophets. And he asked them, but who do you say that I am? And Peter answered him, you are the Christ. And he strictly charged them to tell no one about him. And he began to teach them that the son of man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And he said this plainly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. And calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the clarity of it. And Lord, even in the midst of a a message that might be difficult for us, we ask God that you would lead and direct, that we would listen carefully to what your word has to say. Give us ears to hear. Give us minds to be able to uh, comprehend the truth and the calling in our lives. And, And then Lord, give us faith, faith to live these things out for the glory of our Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray in his name. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you. You can take your seats. We really want to dive into this text right away today and start out with two questions, two what I call the million-dollar questions. And in this text, the first million-dollar question that Jesus asks is found in verses 27 and 28. He says, who am I? Who am I? And Jesus went on with his disciples to the village of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they told him John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, and others, one of the prophets. Who do people say that I am? Now, Jesus isn't asking the question because uh, he was not sure who he was or what he was doing here or, you know, some codependency problem. He, he's asking the question because he's setting the table for the next question. But it's important for us to consider what people think about Jesus and who they thought or who we think uh, Jesus is. And so that's the first question, who am I? And the disciples answered him, some say that you're John the Baptist. King Herod thought he was uh, John the Baptist in Mark 6, 14 and 16. 
others. They think you're Elijah. Now, that was a, a misunderstanding of Malachi's prophecy from a Malachi 4, 5. But, you know, we think you're Elijah. We think you're, we think you're John the Baptist, the forerunner. We think you're Elijah in uh, Matthew chapter 16. Uh, this same, uh, this same, the account of the same story um, said that some think you're Jeremiah, uh, the prophet. Or in this account, you're one of the prophets. Uh, you're a man. You're an important man, but you're just a man. Um, others of his day thought even more. In Ma Matthew 10, 25, some said they thought he was the devil. He was Beelzebub. And that's what they thought about Jesus Christ. Now, what did his own family think about Jesus Christ? Well, sometimes they thought he was nuts. They thought he was crazy. And in um, Mark 3, 21, they thought that their brother or their son was somehow mentally deranged. Um, Who am I, Jesus says. You know, in our world today, we might add, some skeptics would say that Jesus was just a fabrication of, of the religious, and he never really even existed. Um, too much history to really go anywhere down that path. Uh, if you have an old Encyclopedia Britannica set at your house, there are 20,000 words given to tell about Jesus, and it never hints that he didn't exist. Others would say, well, he was just a good man. He was a good, simple teacher for us to learn things from. And, but he's certainly not a savior, certainly not one for us to follow, certainly not one for us to commit our lives to. So who do you or who do people say that I am? And none of the answers given were the right answer. None of the answers given brought us to the, the fact and the reality that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. I love what C.S. Lewis said. It's going to come up on the screen. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit on at him and kill him as a demon. Or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come up with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He's not let that open to us. He did not intend to. Jesus was far more than a teacher. Jesus Christ is the Messiah. And so the question is asked, and Jesus lays it out, who do people say that I am? Well, you're a good guy. You're a good teacher. We can't explain what's going on, but the world never gets to he is the Messiah. Because when you get to the Messiah, that he is the Messiah, you get to a life change. You get to a new reality in your life, which really leads to the second question in verses 29 and 30. The second million dollar question is, who am I to you? Who am I to you? Look what the text says in 29 and 30. It says, and he asked them, but who do you say that I am? And Peter answered him, you are the Christ. You are the Christ. He strictly charged them to tell no one about him. You are, are the Messiah. You are the Messiah. See, the most important question you can answer in your life is, who do you say Jesus is? Who is Jesus Christ to you. If you get the answer to this question wrong, you get it all wrong in your life. Uh, there is no other way to God except through Jesus Christ. Is that an exclusive thing? It's a totally exclusive thing. It's what God's word teaches us. And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except, except by me. Your answer to this question will determine your eternity. Who do you say that I am? You get this wrong, and you miss out on eternity in heaven with God, worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ. You end up separated from God in hell for eternity. So you answer the question, who do you say I am? Your, change or deter your eternity will also determine how you live today. Peter said, you're the Christ. You're the Christ. Peter knew the opinion of the crowd and how complimentary their words were towards Christ, but it wasn't accurate. It, it wasn't enough. They, they missed the whole boat. Jesus was much more than John the Baptist or Elijah or a prophet. He was more than a national reformer or a miracle worker. Jesus Christ was the anointed one. Jesus Christ was the Messiah. Jesus Christ was our Savior. Jesus Christ was the hope of our redemption. Jesus Christ was the one who would come and suffer a death that we deserved so that we could have a life that we didn't deserve. And he offered that life to us as a free gift to us. 
Who do you say that I am? You're the Messiah. You're the anointed one. You're the one who was sent so we could have eternal life. You're the one who would be the deliverer. Now, I believe most people in this room have come to the place where they put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ as their Savior. And so when the question is asked, who is this Jesus? Who was he claiming to be? He wasn't just a teacher. He wasn't just somebody to help us get through the day. He is our hope. He is our, when I stand before God, it's because of what he did, because I'm with him. It's because of the hope I have in Jesus Christ. But if you're here today and you've never trusted Jesus Christ, See, that's the claim that he made. I am the Messiah. And Peter got the answer right to the question. And you have to decide what you will do with Jesus. Who do you say that I am? Jesus offers us the free gift of eternal life through faith alone in Christ alone. And if you will believe the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ, then you will be saved. You'll be saved. Your eternity will be taken care of. If you've never done that, you can do this this morning. You can trust Christ and you can be saved. In church, not only does it change our eternity, but the answer to that question changes the way we live today. Jesus Christ is our Savior. Jesus Christ is the Lord. And as a result of that, we're going to live differently. We're going to um, have a life that um, lives out for the glory of God. And although my prayer is that people would trust Christ and be saved, my prayer in this message as we uh, talk about the topic of surrender is that God would work in our hearts and lives and uh, take us from our own selfishness, self-included in that, and and yield it over to what Christ is calling us to and a desire to be full out for that, uh, for the glory of God. And so uh, let's move on through the message. Here's the next thing I want you to see, the surrender of a servant explained in verses 31 to 33. You see, suffering and surrender are linked. They're always linked. If we're going to surrender to Christ, there's going to be a price to be paid. And Jesus begins to teach this very early in his ministry. Verses 31 to 33, and he began to teach them about the son of, how the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and killed and after three days rise again. And he said this plainly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Jesus now teaches three times in the book of Mark that he would have to suffer, he would be rejected, he would be killed, and he would rise on the third day. Why? Why? Well, one, because of man's sin. Jesus Christ had to come because of our sinfulness. And the other thing is Jesus Christ came because of God's love for us. So we have this tension or this reality that we're sinners separated from God who have no hope. And Christ will come, the hope of glory. And on the other hand, we have this reality that God so loved the world that he sent his only son. And God's love and his passion for us is being demonstrated in Jesus Christ, this Messiah who is going to come. But he's not going to fulfill what people thought the Messiah would come and do because Jesus Christ was going to be the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And it wasn't about Jerusalem. It wasn't about politics. It was about eternity. A suffering Messiah unthinkable. The Messiah was a symbol of strength, not of weakness. And so when we think about Peter's response and what he does, I I think we need to be a little bit careful. I think we give Peter a bad rap sometimes. Uh, Again, we always remember that we live on the other side of the cross. We live on the other side of the resurrection. Uh, We live on the other side and we're looking back and we're always going, why couldn't he get it? Why couldn't he get it? I think if I had been there and I'm thinking, you're the Messiah. See, he got that right on the test. You're, you are the Messiah. And, and, and in Matthew, he's encouraged for those words. And then Jesus goes, but. But you need to understand this Messiah is going to suffer and this Messiah is going to die. And then this Messiah is going to rise again on the third day. And Peter's like, uh-uh, no way, Lord. That's not what Messiahs do. Messiahs come and they conquer. Messiahs come and they be kings. Messiahs don't come and suffer. And unwittingly, without any intent, 
Peter is used by Satan. You know, a principle that I learned in this is you don't have to be demon-possessed for Satan to use you. You don't have to be demon-possessed for Satan to you lose. You see, to let down your guard and take your eyes off what is true and start putting your focus on mixing yourself with the Word of God, and all of a sudden you can be teaching babble that doesn't come from God, isn't true, and Peter loved Jesus. But when he heard that the Messiah would suffer and the Messiah would die, Peter's like, no way, Lord, is that going to happen to you. Peter confessed Jesus as the Messiah. Jesus complimented Peter, telling him that God had revealed that to him in Matthew 16. And Jesus tells of his impending suffering and death. And Peter felt that that wasn't right. And he believed that he heard from God. And so Peter rebukes Jesus. What Peter said, though, didn't line up with what Jesus had just taught. It didn't line up with what the Old Testament, Isaiah 53, taught. It didn't line up with God's word. Peter had gone off on his own truth and lost the source of uh, his authority under Jesus Christ. I got thinking about that a little bit. And, and Peter rebuked Jesus. Okay, I don't know where in your mind you ever think that's a good idea, right? I, I, Jesus, God, Messiah, the Savior, the hope, eh, you got it wrong, I'm getting it right, and that's never going to happen to you. Peter's not possessed. But Peter's focus is on the wrong thing. We have to be so careful that when we teach the word of God, we teach the word of God. We don't allow our opinions or our thoughts or our hopes for this world to get in the way of what God's word is plainly teaching to us. Jesus turns and he rebukes him. Look at verse 33. But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, get behind me, Satan. For you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. You are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. You see, the battle is for your mind. The battle is for your mind. And Peter's mind is off wondering, wondering about what he wants and how this is all supposed to work out and, and how he's going to maybe be the second in command or how God's going to use him through all Jesus is going to be as the king in Jerusalem. And, and he goes off and the battle is for his mind and his mind is taken away from the things of God. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. The focus of our mind is towards the Lord. In Romans 12, 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Your mind. Let this mind be in you. Your mind is what really helps us in the area of repentance. Repentance isn't just turning away from something to something else. Repentance is a change of your mind. And Peter's mind is out of touch with what God had said and what God would do. And Jesus rebukes him. Get behind me, Satan. You can be sure Peter wasn't aware that he spoke for Satan. He wasn't trying to be a messenger of the evil one. But he had just gone from giving the most incredible answer to the question of who do people say that I am? You are the Christ. To the Lord having to put Peter in his place. Get behind me, Satan. That's wrong. The things you're saying are not what I'm about. I have come to be the Messiah. And the Messiah will come and the Messiah will suffer. And although that's not what your plan for the Messiah is, this is what God's plan for the Messiah is. And Jesus begins to set the foundation for suffering and rejection and being killed and how important that would be so that we could have eternal life. And then in the text, the text goes on and there's this call for us to our personal surrender. Jesus it goes on in verse 34, look, he says, and calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow 
me. If you don't understand that Christ came and had to suffer so that we could have eternal life, you will never get to the place of our own personal surrender and the call on our life to the very same kind of things. The things that God is calling um, Jesus to do are the things he calls us to do. And you're like, well, maybe, maybe, pastor, maybe this was just for the disciples because we know most of them suffered as martyrs and all the rest of it. And, you know, you might be able to make that argument, except at the beginning of that verse, Jesus makes it really clear. And calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, this wasn't just for the 12, this was for the crowd. And by extension, we are the crowd. And so what Christ is calling the followers to or those who are considering him is the, is the same thing for the disciples as it is for us as was pictured in his life. Calling the crowd. If anyone would come after me. Um, so do you want to follow Jesus? Here's the cost. Do you want to be a true follower? Do you want to be a true disciple of Jesus Christ? Here's the cross. Here's the cost. You must deny yourself. You must take up your cross. It wasn't just Christ's destiny. It wasn't just the destiny for the, the 12. It was our destiny. So let's look and think about what does that mean? What is Christ calling us to as his, as his followers? Here's the first thing he says. You must deny yourself. You must deny yourself. I love what Warren Wearsby said about this. It'll come up on the screen for you. Deny self is not the same as self-denial. We practice self-denial when for a good purpose we occasionally give up a thing or an activity. But we deny self when we surrender ourselves to Christ and determine to obey his will. I think it's really about motives. Um, we come to that place of self-denial. I'm not going to eat ice cream anymore because it makes me get fat. I'm going to not going to whatever it is, and it's like I just self denial, right? It's about motive. Denying self is I'm I'm putting that all aside because of Jesus. I'm putting that all aside because of Jesus. And so in this text, he says, if you want to follow me, follower of Christ, if you want to follow me, Jesus says you have to deny yourself. What does that look like? Well, denying self means denying sinful self the things that we desire in our lives, the things that we go to, the, the way that we live out our lives, the ungodliness that we allow to happen, the worldly lust that we pursue or go after in our lives, or, or, or maybe it's a former companions in our lives, people that have way too much influence in our lives. And we're not willing to set them aside. So whether it's a, an activity or, or a, what we look at on our computer, or, or maybe it's like this. I've, I've talked to too many Christians, and I've struggled with this, where you, you have a friend, and they're influencing you. And they're influencing you away from Christ. And I've had people in my office, and they go, no, 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 no. My, my goal is I want them to know Jesus. I want them to know Jesus. I want them to know Jesus. And I go, they're taking you down. Are you willing to set that aside for the sake of Jesus Christ? So you have to be willing to set aside the things in our lives that are sinful. I'm not saying you shouldn't have unsaved friends. We all need to have unsaved friends and acquaintances. But who's influencing who? And what direction are they pulling you to? And if they're pulling you away in your walk with God, then you need to get away from those things. You need to get away from those people. You need to get away from those kind of activities. Are deny sinful self. No longer living like the rest of the world. In 1 Corinthians 6, 18, it says, flee immorality. Just flee it. In whatever form it comes in for you, deny yourself. I don't need that in my life anymore. I don't want that in my life anymore. Flee immorality. Flee mentally, physically, emotionally, socially. Deny yourself involves denying sinful self. Denying self also involves denying self-righteous self, our own works of righteousness. You know, uh, Paul said, if anybody had a right to boast, it was him. And he said, but I choose to boast in Christ. I choose to boast in Christ. And so he kept turning the fame away from himself and towards Jesus Christ. And everything he did, turning the fame away from himself and towards the Lord. How do you do at that? So you might not have a problem with pornography. Maybe your problem is with you. And you think too highly of yourself. 
And you need to deny yourself and turn the fame towards the Lord Jesus Christ for what he's done for you and what he's accomplished in your life. You have to deny yourself. If anyone would come after me, then you need a person who denies self by being other-centered and Christ-centered, but it starts with deny yourself. Then Jesus goes on, if that wasn't difficult enough, he says, you need to take up your cross. Take up your cross. Everybody knew what Jesus meant when he uses this illustration. Um, take up your cross. You only, you only took up your cross once, right? Uh, Jesus took up his cross, and he went, and he died. Now, we're going to come back because it says daily in the scripture in another text, but you need to take up your cross, See, for them, the cross wasn't sanitized like it is for us. Um, lots of people wear a cross around their neck. I'm not saying that's wrong to do or not, but it's nice and clean. It's made out of gold, and it's pretty, and it can be used as a tool for a testimony. Why do you wear that thing? I get all that. I don't know. But we've sanitized the cross. The cross was gross. The cross was ugly. The cross was for guilty people. The cross was for people who had to be put to death. And Jesus says, if you want to follow me, then here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to Take up my cross. And you need to take up, you need to take up your cross. It was for the person who was condemned. They were required to carry his cross to the place of their execution. It was, it was um, done and they would accept the pain and the shame and the persecution. That's what Jesus would do for us. Now, in Luke 9, it says you need to take up your cross daily. Daily. So it's like, okay, wait a minute. You can you only really take up your cross once, right? Because you're at the end of it. You're, there's no next day, right? And so what's Jesus saying when he says take up your cross daily? Well, it's a picture. It's a metaphor. Not everyone, not everyone in this room, not every Christian since the time, began of time has, has taken up a cross and physically gone and died on a cross. There's a picture here of what's accomplished in our lives and what we're being called to. But Jesus says, this kind of willingness, this kind of desire to live for the Lord, we need to be willing to do that and take it up daily in our lives. I will endure whatever hardship I need to do to receive the well-done, good, and faithful servant to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, in the case of the apostles, most of them, at some way were martyred or put to death in some form for their faith, or they were imprisoned or ridiculed or beaten. They went through suffering, and yet they did it with joy. You hear about Paul in prison and what he suffered, and um, Peter in 1 Peter 4.16, it says, Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. And so the thing that I'm called to do in taking up my cross and following Christ, when it gets hard, when it gets difficult, God help me to give the glory to God. God help me to get my fame and my eyes on Jesus Christ and rejoice in what he's done and what he's accomplished for me. They suffered, they died, they were ridiculed. Maybe for us, it might not be physical death. It might be ridicule, somebody speaking evil of you. You might get excluded. You might lose a job opportunity. Um, you might get harassed a little bit. But because of who Jesus Christ is and because of what he has done for me, God, I'll go all the way with that. I'll do whatever that takes. Deny yourself, take up your cross, and then Jesus says, and follow me. Follow me. The things that I'm being called to, you're being called to. What does it mean to follow Jesus? Well, there's lots of things, but, you know, just to go back to an old illustration of the wristband, the WWJD, it's like, what would Jesus do? Sue said, you've got to tell the people what that means because there's young people in the room who don't know what WWJD is. I go, how young can you be and not know that? But apparently, it's true. What would Jesus do? That's a question we need to ask all the time in our lives. What did Jesus call us to? What would Jesus do in our lives? Do we do what his word says? You need to follow me. Do what my word says. You need to follow me. You need to walk in my footsteps, no matter the cost. You need to follow me. You need to obey the gospel of Christ. You need to follow me. You need to keep on growing in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. See, this cost of discipleship, it seems rather high. 
What Jesus Christ is calling us to is a high calling. It's a high cost. But it's what disciples of Jesus Christ will do. Why? Why? Because we're living vertically challenged about the glory of God. The reason that you would be willing to do this, I am willing to do this, is because of what Christ has already done for us. I deserve hell. I deserve separation from God. Christ has given me eternal life through the finished work of Christ by transferring my trust in faith alone, in Christ alone. That's enough to say I'm living for Jesus no matter what. But there's more to come. There's eternal life that is for us. And so this calling to discipleship, this calling to surrender is a high calling, but it's because of what's been accomplished and what's still coming for us. Don't get lost in this world and forget all that's out there for us and what God is doing. Two negatives, deny yourself, take up your cross, one positive, and follow me. Deny self, take up your cross, follow Jesus, I wrote this down. Whether anyone else does or not, I will. Whether anyone else does or not, I will follow Jesus. But, but my best friend, he's walking away from the faith. Whatever, no matter what anyone else does, I will follow Jesus. But it's hard in my family, no matter what anyone else does, I will follow Jesus. Jesus says, you want to be a follower of me? You have to deny yourself, take up your cross, follow me. Remember, Jesus was alone when he went to the cross. No one went there with him. He suffered for us. An amazing work. Jesus goes on and he gives some explanation to them to help them more fully understand that. If, if you are a disciple and in, in, in the ESV, and I think most versions, there's the word for. It starts the next verses, starting at verse uh, 35. There's four of them. Uh, four times Jesus says for. Um, and four principles that we can pull from that. Here's the first one in verse 35. He says... For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. This for is the surrender of your life. It's a call to surrender of our life. Why we must take up the cross and follow Jesus. There are only two choices. And in this verse, he says, you can, you can, you can, whoever would save his life, you're going to lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. And there's the surrender of our life, no matter what it takes. Now, interesting, the, uh, as I was reading the, the different writers on these things, there's, there's this picture of the disciples who are like followers of Christ. Then there's the crowd. And so some would say some of this applies to reward. Um, and, and it could be, as you think about a disciple um, and surrendering your life and what will come out of that for you. Um, I think the primary illustration that Christ is giving is about being in Christ in these verses. And so this first one about that is whoever would save his life, you're going to lose it. You think this world is more important right now? It's really demonstrating where Christ really is on your importance list and who he really is to you. You want to have all this stuff now? You'll lose all the stuff later. If you've never trusted Christ, it's clear as clear as can be that you'll get it all now. You'll have it all now. And then you'll spend eternity separated from God. See, if you save your life, you'll lose it. But if you lose your life, like Jesus is saying, deny yourself, take up your cross, you will save it. Eternity is coming. Hope for you uh, to be with the Lord forever. It's all there. I dwell in the house of the Lord forever. It's all still coming for us. Surrender your life. Surrender your life. In verse 36, he talks about surrendering your stuff. Verse 36, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? You got it all figured out. You've got it all. You've got the three-car garage. We got, Sue and I were going down to visit Gala and Ezra and little Selah. Um, what day was that? Friday? And uh, we were going across, and we went up Post Road. Oh, my goodness. I can't afford their garage of the people on Post Road. Um, those are amazing homes. I found myself, I said to Sue, I can't go down this road anymore. I'm getting covetous. Just going down the road. Um, those are people who want stuff now. They got these mansions down there that are incredible. Well, what does it profit a man to get all that stuff? 
for your 30 or 40 years now and forfeit your soul. It doesn't mean that all things are wrong. We have lots of things in our society, but too often things uh, control us and, and the things aren't being used for the Lord and the priorities get all messed up and all of that. And I love that Jesus starts out with that. What does a profit a man if he gains the whole world and he loses his soul? See, they get the question, the answer to the question, who do you say that I am wrong? And they want possessions and they want position and they want pleasure and they want power. But the word says you will lose your soul. So there's a surrender of life. There's a surrender of stuff. In verse 37, I believe it talks about the surrender of works. For what can a man give in return for his soul? So many people are out there trying so hard and they think, oh, I'll be all right before God. And, and people who come to church, they think, no, no, the scale's going to balance in my favor. And I'm, I'm, I'm a pretty good person. I, my good stuff outweighs my bad stuff. I've just tried to do the best I can. Surely God's going to say that's enough. What can a man give in return for his soul? How much work can you do to save your soul? You can't. You can't. Salvation is because of the finished work of Jesus Christ alone. And then the last four is found in verse 38. And it's the surrender of focus. For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Whoever is ashamed of me in this world Jesus said, I will be ashamed. I will be ashamed of. So let me ask you this. Are you ashamed of Jesus Christ? Not when you're sitting in this room. Not when you're in small group. Maybe not when you're at home in the quiet of your house. But when you're in the workplace. Or you're with your neighbor. Or someone asks you a difficult question. Do you find yourself cowering, uh, moving away from your faith in Jesus Christ and just giving an answer that will appease the people so that you won't need to make a stand? I don't want Jesus to say, uh, hey, Paul, you're ashamed of me. I gave my life for you. I sacrificed it all for you. You were ashamed of me. I gave you the hope you didn't deserve. And you're ashamed of me. I've given you eternal life. Does that describe you? Does that describe your walk with God? There's this hypocrisy that goes on when you're all together like this, when we're like this, and, and what we're like when we need to make our stand for the Lord Jesus Christ. If anyone would come after me, Jesus said, you need to deny yourself and take up your cross and follow me. There's, a, there's glory at stake here. Uh, the last verse says, um, for whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. We live for Christ. We live out for Christ. See, I know in this message it's difficult because it's like, no, but I want my stuff now. I want my stuff now. You have to choose. Choose this day who you will serve. I want what Christ wants for me. I want eternal life. I want the hope that's to come. If you want to follow of me, if to deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. And as a result, there will be a great glory, a great hope for the followers of Christ. Well, so what? So what? Who do you say that I am? Oh, you're the Christ. You're my Savior. You're my hope. You're my Redeemer. Without you, I am defeated. Without you, I have no eternal life. Without you, I am doomed. Well, then deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow Jesus 
and whether anyone else does or not, I will live for Christ. Let's pray. Father, this call to surrender is a difficult message for us to even hear because it's so anti-everything that our world says. Our world says, you can have it now, you can have it now, you can have it now. And Jesus says, let it go, let it go, let it go. Teach us, Father, that we be men and women of God who willingly, because of the amazing work of Christ, live for the hope of our Savior for your glory. Do this work as only you can because we're looking to you, the author, the finisher, the perfecter of our faith. You are our hope, you are our righteousness. And so, Lord, I will, I will deny myself. I will daily take up my cross, my cross. I will follow you. And looking forward to the day when you say, well done, good and faithful servant. Oh, God, teach us to do that more. God, work in us, bring us to the place of conviction and repentance with a renewed desire to live for our Savior. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.